collision theory. The reaction mechanism. And so essentially what this is, is the steps that a reaction goes through in order to get from the reactants to the products. And what we've been assuming so far is that the reactants, they either initially without, they go right to the products. That doesn't happen. They actually form the activated complex and then they go to the products. But again, that's probably an oversimplification as well. It's probably done in more than one step. Those steps that we've been ignoring until now are what we call the reaction mechanism. Um, we're going to talk about the, the steps themselves as being elementary reactions or elementary steps. And if you were to sum them all together, you get your overall reaction. So reaction mechanism produces reaction intermediates that get consumed in later steps. Um, these aren't the same as activated complex, so, so they're, they're a little bit more stable than those activated complex. They are actually going to be produced, um, and then they are going to be consumed again later in the reaction. So imagine uh, methane reacting with oxygen. So, so C4 plus uh, two oxygen molecules is going to form some carbon dioxide and water. But if you were to actually imagining that happen on a particle level, so are they in collision theory? So the chances of having three particles collide right in the right spot with the right energy and the right geometry is going to be relatively rare. Um, however, methane burns super easily. And, and a lot more complex things than methane also burn super easily. So anything that involves more than two colliding particles is going to be relatively unlikely to occur all that often. So what happens instead is that it happens in multiple steps. So the mechanism is essentially those steps that are involved in the process of this reaction. One of those steps is going to be the slowest one, and this is where it ties into the rate law. So reactions will happen in multiple steps. We call those steps elementary steps or elementary reactions. One of them is going to be the sort of hardest one to do. It'll probably have the highest activation energy. It'll, it'll be the least likely to occur um, or require the, the most energy in order to occur. And this is where we bring in our rate law equation that we were working on earlier. That rate law equation, those orders, those exponents in the rate law equation, they actually tell us which of the elementary steps in a reaction, which one's the slowest. So the rate of reaction is dependent on that slowest step, and the rate law equation is going to tell us which of those elementary steps is the slowest. So these mechanisms, um, how we come up with them, again, we, we can't see them happening very easily. It's very hard to test for these little steps that occur between the beginning and the end of a reaction. But our rate law does give us some information um, based on the experimental data as to which of the reactants slows down the reaction the most or has the greatest effect on the rate of reaction. And um, those exponents will actually illuminate a little bit of the um, inner workings of the reaction. So chemists, we're going to use the rate law first of all, and then we can essentially fill in the gaps using our intuition and what we know about particles and what's most likely. Um, but there can be several different answers as to what can be the mechanism, the steps that happen between the beginning and the end of a reaction. As long as you follow these three rules, your mechanism could be possible. Um, so again, there, there could be multiple mechanisms proposed for, proposed for any given reaction, but they definitely have to follow this. So first off, um, no breaking the law of conservation of, of uh, um, mass. We, if each of the steps has to balance. So you can't just create new particles out of nothing. You can't just destroy particles. You got to make sure each of the, the um, steps, each of the reactions that happen, the elementary reactions, balance. The second thing is that rate determining step does tell us something. And so we need to make sure that the rate law that gave us the exponents um, tells us the rate determining step. Then the whole point is to make sure that we end up with the overall balanced reaction. So when you are done coming up with the different steps, they need to add up together to give you your overall balanced reaction. And as long as you follow these three uh, rules for building your mechanism, your mechanism could be possible.
So the rate determining step, um, the molecularity of the slowest step. So remember, we're talking about multiple steps happening between the reactants on their way to become products. It could be happening in multiple steps. One of them is going to be the slowest one. And the molecularity, or essentially the coefficients in that equation, are going to be based on the rate law. Or conversely, if you already knew what the slowest step was, you could say, okay, let's look at the coefficients in the slowest step, and that will actually allow us to come up with the rate law. So if you have the rate law, you can come up with the slowest step, or if you have the slowest step, you can come up with the rate law. Let's try it out. So this question is going to involve uh, mechanisms. That's what we're looking at here, um, rates, and then we'll, we'll draw it on a potential energy diagram as well. So we've, we've seen this reaction here. Um, two nitrogen dioxide uh, molecules reacting with a fluorine molecule form two NO2Fs. Um, the delta H for this happens to be negative 284 kilojoules, so it's an exothermic reaction. Uh, if you were to solve for the rate law based on experimental data, you'd find out the rate law for this reaction is um, the rate is equal to the rate constant K multiplied by the change in concentration of NO2. And importantly, the exponent works out to be one for NO2. So what it's saying is the change in concentration of NO2 has a linear effect on the rate. And it's the same for the change in concentration of F2. They're both first order with respect to NO2 and first order with respect to F2. Those exponents, they are what will help us determine the mechanism for this reaction. Those exponents in the rate law tell us the molecularity or the coefficients in the slowest step of the rate law. So let's try doing this. Let's propose a mechanism for this reaction, and then we'll draw a potential energy diagram to hopefully visualize what we're talking about when we're talking about mechanism. But essentially what we're saying is, yes, we're taking these two reactants, and they're going and producing this product. However, it doesn't necessarily happen in one go. It might happen in several steps. So think about it when you're uh, when you're building a, a, a car out of Lego. So you buy a Lego set for a car. Um, you don't just take all of the pieces and jam them together and you have a car. Um, essentially, that's that's the overall process. You start with a bunch of pieces and you end with a car. But the process is broken up into several steps. And it's the same thing for reaction. So just because we have these pieces here doesn't mean we just jam them together in one go and we end up with a product. There may be several steps involved. So we might have to do step one, where we might do something, and step two, and we do something else, and step three, we do something else. In the end, we get the overall equation, the pieces forming the product, but it may take several steps to do that. These steps, that's the mechanism. So let's, uh, let's see how this looks. This uh, is, so we have here on the bottom, our overall reaction. So that's sort of our goal. That, that's what we need to get to in the end. That's the overall process. Our rate law told us that we have um, one NO2 reacting with one F2. Those exponents in our rate law, the first order with respect to NO2 and the first order with respect to F2, tell us that there's going to be a mechanism. So I'm, I'm going to have, like, let's say this is step one here, and I'll do step two here. Um, and they're going to sum together, and they will give us our overall equation. But of these steps, let's call this step one, and let's call that step two. Um, of these steps, the slowest one, slowest has one NO2 reacting with one F2. So that is what the rate law tells us. Those exponents tell us what are the coefficients in the slowest step of the mechanism. And I can't change those because that's not what the rate law says. The rate law says one NO2 and one F2. So I'm stuck with that. Let's get rid of those. It looks a little bit better. So other things can happen on the process. So on my, on my way down to get to the overall balanced equation, I can take other steps. But the first one, I cannot change the molecules involved in carrying out the slowest step. Whatever the rate law tells me, that's all I've got. That's the only thing I can work with. The rest of it you get to make up. So imagine we've got 
we're going to have to end this reaction. We have to make sure it balanced. Um, and then we're going to add in some other steps as well. All of that we get to make up. And by make up, I mean we, we have some flexibility. We do have to follow those three rules, though. They have to balance. Um, the slowest step has to agree with the rate law, so we, we check that rule is done. Each step has to balance, and in the end, they have to sum up to give us our overall order, our overall balanced chemical equation. So let's look at this first one. Again, multiple options, but um, knowing where we're going to go, I can say, okay, well, let, let's let's imagine that NO2. Let's imagine one of these Fs gets joined onto it. So I end up with the NO2 and the F is now attached to it. That would leave the other fluorine as a, a, a fluorine radical. So that could happen. It's not the only thing that could happen, but it's possible. Um, I need to make sure that that balances. It does balance, so I'm, I'm good in that regard. So I haven't changed the coefficients, so I'm also good in that it still reflects the rate law because the slowest step, the coefficients of the reactants in the slowest step have to agree with the rate law. So there's a one in front of the NO2 and a one in front of the F2. That's good. It balances. That's good. I now just have to make sure that I can get to the overall balanced chemical equation with the next step. So um, maybe I, I could say, okay, well, let's in the second step um, use another NO2 and let's have it react with that fluorine radical that got produced in the first step. And I could have them go through a reaction and maybe they'll get stuck together too, kind of like what happened in the first one. And I produce another NO2F. So again, I, I'm sort of making up what the possibilities are, but as long as they balance and, and look at that, it balances. Um, and I haven't messed around with the slowest steps coefficients, I can come up with whatever I want use the end result as a guide. So I know I have to end up with, because these have to sum, the, the mechanism has to sum up to give me my overall balanced chemical equation. I have an NO2 already, one of them. And so if I add a second one, those guys are going to add up to give me my two NO2s. So that's great. Um, I know I have an F2 on the left-hand side, and it's going to sum up if I add those two um, steps, step one and step two of the mechanism. Um, that F2 will end up at the bottom here. I also have an NO2F and an NO2F, so they're going to add up to give me my two NO2Fs. Luckily, this fluorine radical that got produced in the first um, uh, elementary step gets consumed in the second one, so it will cancel itself out, which is good because it doesn't show up in the overall balance chemical equation. So this works out as a pretty good mechanism. Let's get rid of some of these lines so we can see that mechanism again. Oh, got rid of too much here. So I had a NO2F and an O there. So as a mechanism, I am leaving the slowest steps coefficients as one and one because that's what the rate law tells me there. Those exponents in the rate law are the coefficients in the slowest step. Um, each equation balances, and the steps in the mechanism add up to give me my overall balanced chemical equation. So it's a good mechanism. I can use that as my proposed mechanism. So a slow step based on the rate law, I need the overall equation. Um, again, you can come up with more than one mechanism for this given reaction, as long as you follow those, those three rules. Let's get rid of the, my chicken scratch here so you can see the same information, but legible. So this, as a proposed mechanism, works quite well. Um, it follows all three rules, so it's a good mechanism. Now, imagine a potential energy diagram for this. We know the overall reaction is um, exothermic, so the, the reactants start with more energy and the products have less. Um, and I'm saying it happens in two steps, step one and step two. So step one would involve some reaction. This is my sketch here. Um, step one would involve some reaction that produces these products. And then those guys would go through some other reaction and um, eventually produce the reactants. So let's look at a better diagram than that. Um, so this would be a, a decent potential energy diagram sketch. I said that this happens in two steps. So I have step one here and the production of NO2 and F. And I have step two here and then the products. The overall delta H is a 
negative delta H, which is good because it's an exothermic reaction. Um, another thing is we know the first step of the mechanism is the slowest step. So it would make sense that our first step here has a higher activation energy than our second step. So that, that should show up in our potential energy diagram as well. Activated complexes, we didn't draw them, but they'd be somewhere between the uh, beginning and end, the reactants and products of each step. So, so there you have those activated complexes here. Um, and this, this fluorine is interesting as well. We create this fluorine radical during the mechanism, but it gets consumed again um, within the reaction itself. So we refer to that as a reaction intermediate. It is not at the beginning of the reaction. You don't, you don't see it in any of the reactants. It's not in the products, but it does get produced during the reaction and then consumed again. So it gets canceled out. Um, that's what's known as a reaction intermediate.